Inner chaos is part of so many lives. When we go through it, we often try to hide it on the outside. Now I'm okay. I'm all good. But inside, there's a struggle. Why do I feel this way? Am I broken? Am I the only one feeling like this? When people connected with Jesus, they would grow to trust Him, pull down the mask they wore. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's um, let's begin by reading Scripture. Father, uh, thank you so much for such a great night already, and thank you for your word, Father. Um, there's power in your word, and if nothing else, Lord, we, we ask, Lord, as you presence yourself right now with us, you're the risen Jesus. You are the word of God, and we pray that as we read your word, that your word will do its mighty work in us. If nothing else tonight, Father, let your word just inspire us refresh us, reinvigorate us, open our hearts and our eyes, draw us closer to you, draw us closer to maturity. Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight is like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, Though in the morning it it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. The length of our days is 70 years or 80, if you have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they pass quickly. They quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Amen. Amen. So um, a few weeks ago, um, well, probably a month ago now, Monica and Colin, they, uh, they came and said, hey, we'd love you to speak, um, you know, in this series that we're doing, It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And I says, oh, great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I always love the opportunity to come and speak. Um, and then they, I said, well, what's it going to be on, you know, faith or, um, you know, is it going to be about, um, you know, power? Uh, you know, something that I know all about. Uh, Is it going to be about, um, you know, just youthful enthusiasm? And Colin said, no, no, we'd like you to talk about aging and decay. Decay. How would I know anything about that? (laughs) But um, no, it's a real challenge. Uh, It's a a cool topic, and it's actually something that, um, yeah, that God has uh, kind of spoken to me about over the years. And so, um, yeah, I'd love to just to share some thoughts on that tonight. But just to get started, um, just turn to someone near you who you don't know that well. So husbands don't, and wives don't do that, um, or boyfriends and girlfriends or best friends. Turn to someone that you don't know and just guess their age, all right? So you've just got a minute. Just try to guess each other's age just to get started. Make sure you say hi. Introduce yourselves if you don't know each other. I think the rule of thumb, I think the rule of thumb when you do that is always guess about 20 years younger, you know, than you kind of think just in case. Um, So, um, 
But uh, yeah, we're talking about aging tonight, and uh, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because when I first started thinking about it, well, the, my first thought was, well, what would I know about aging? Um, you know, like I'm still 50, 60 years away from being an old guy, so I don't know anything about it. But then as, as I started to think about it, it was kind of cool. I started looking into the scriptures. Um, so, um, it's, you know, my, my, what I was thinking I was originally going to say I kept a bit of that, but then God just kind of gave me some other ideas and some fresh insights, so I'm looking forward to trying to share those with you today. I will never um, forget, I will always remember um, when my dad, uh, living in St. Catharines, Ontario, we, we lived about 60 miles away from Toronto, and, um, and, you know, we didn't, we weren't really well off, and we didn't take a lot of big trips, and we didn't do a lot of extravagant things, but one night, out of the blue, my dad took myself and my two brothers uh, to Toronto to see the Toronto Maple Leafs play. Uh, and it's just, it was an unbelievable experience. I was about 10 or 11 years old. Who's a Toronto Maple Leaf fan here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Katrina, do you feel the pain? <laughs> Please just have a prayer for Katrina and I because the Leafs haven't won the Stanley Cup since, what, 1963, all right? But the Chicago Cubs have given us hope, haven't they? I think they were about 100 years, so the Leafs aren't that bad. And we went to see the Toronto Maple Leafs play. And as a young sort of 11, 12-year-old, and I had only ever been to Junior A games in our town, which were pretty amazing, you know, 3,000 people just stacked into this tiny little arena. And we had a really good Junior A team, the St. Catharines Blackhawks, um, and they won the, the, the Canadian Championship a bunch of times. So I grew up with this. And then, uh, here we are in Toronto, and, and you know, if, if you're in Ontario, and in fact, every Canadian should just love the Toronto Maple Leafs, and here we are in this, in this arena with 17,000 seats, and they had the color lights, they just started color, um, you, know, you know, color games, and these lights come on, and everything's just beautiful and bright, you got these beautiful blue uniforms, and I think they were playing the Chicago Blackhawks, and the ice was white, and I was just out of control. My dad bought us peanuts in the shell, and that's what you do at hockey games, hot dogs, and uh, I don't even think Coke was invented, but you'd eat these peanuts, and you, you make a mess, and I can remember, um, you know, and I will never forget, I will always remember looking up at center ice, and we were sort of sitting halfway up, and looking up above center ice, and there was the clock. There was that clock. And I will always remember as the game started, I was having so much fun. And my brothers and I were pinching each other. And we just couldn't believe we were there. And my dad had a big smile, as you do, on his face. Because he knew, he knew we were so stoked. And they dropped the puck. And they got this arena. Just people are screaming and yelling. And it goes all quiet. You can hear the puck hit the ice. And, and the game started. You can hear the skates. You can see the blood. It's great. It's a great sport. And... Uh, and I'll never forget, I will always remember looking up at the clock, and the numbers were actually read in the early clock, and, it, and, and hockey has three 20-minute periods, and, I can, and, and they count down every period, so first period, they count down from 20, and I can remember looking up at that clock, 12 years old, and seeing the 20 kind of go to 1920, 1919, 1918, and I remember this thought, I don't want this ever to stop. I don't want this to end. I was having so much fun, and I was loving this, this experience so much. I can remember seeing that clock. I'm like 12 years old, and I'm seeing the clock go from, you know, there's 60 minutes of hockey, and yet I already get the idea that the clock is winding down. And I had this kind of haunting feeling that I don't want this to stop. And isn't that kind of like all of us with this thing, this beautiful thing that we've got called life? And it's winding down. And we call it aging. So I just want to talk a little bit about that and how you feel about that and, and just a couple of ideas. So just another thought, you know, so when God created Adam and Eve, because that's where it all started, if you believe the Bible, as, and I do. Um, so when God created Adam and Eve, just really quickly, how old do you think they were on the day of creation? Just have a quick chat to the person you're with. You could talk to your husband now or your wife. How old do you think they were? On the day of creation. Just shout out some of your ideas and don't be shy if yours is different. A hundred? 
they were 20. Yep. Oh, yeah, they were 13. All right. Anybody different on that? 30-ish. Yep. All right. We don't really know, do we? But, uh, but, but we, like we know from the, from the Old Testament, we know from the Bible that God created this perfect universe. And he created a perfect planet, and he created a perfect couple. Um, the animals were perfect. Everything was perfect, and there was no decay. And if that had been, if Adam and Eve hadn't have sinned, I would have been at that hockey game when I was 12 years old, and that clock would not have been running. That game would have gone on forever. And that's the way it's meant to be. And I believe that you and I as human beings, um, I think that we carry a shadow we carry a glimmer of that ancient reality in our spirits. I think there's still a shard of paradise in every one of us, and that's why it's so haunting. And that's why it's so upsetting when we realize that this life is winding down. And how did that happen? It's in the Bible uh, that God created this perfect world, but um, he wanted people to love him perfectly freely, and so um, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, um, and you must not touch it, or you will die, and we all know uh, what happened, and so um, Adam and Eve broke that one command, and, and from the moment that they broke it, decay came into the, into the universe, and we don't know what that, all what that means, but we do know that the perfect creation began to decay, and, uh, and God, God had warned them that if you eat of this tree, if you break this command, you will die. And so later on, as God began to give the details of that curse, this is one of the details, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And that's the reality that we find us in. Now, what age, one more question, uh, what age would you like to be forever? So if you were given the choice tonight, and again, have a chat to, to somebody, what age would you like to be if you could be that age forever? If we were in a perfect world, what age would you want to be? Have a quick chat. Is there anybody, is there anybody who said that they'd like to be 70 or 80 forever? Anybody? I'd love to see that. I, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. That might not be a bad thing. Um, but we know, and I, I just kind of did a little bit of reading and stuff over the week. And, uh, and so these are some of the, the graphs. I, I did a bit of reading on aging because I don't know anything about it personally. So I had to um, get it from other people, old people. Um, and so these are, some of the, um, these are some of the things that happen as you age. And if you could see that graph, there's the growth hormone begins to decline uh, from around the age of 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50. It gets lower and lower. Uh, that other graph there that's got the colored spaghetti, um, the, this is the way your brain begins to fall apart from about the age of uh, 19 and 20. Um, at what age... Do humans begin to decline mentally and physically? At what age, do you think? Just shout it out. At what age do we begin to decline mentally and physically? Yeah, if they say it's from 22 to 27, from 22 to we kind of were at the kind of the peak of the hill, and then we begin to decline. Here's a question, though, which leads us into um, what I want to say. At what age do we begin to decline spiritually? Just as I was thinking about this, is one of the fresh ideas that came into my heart. Um, so we, we know that physically we begin to decline. Mentally, well, I don't think I'm ever going to decline, but some of you will. And, uh, but, but, but spiritually, at what age do we begin to decline spiritually? Maybe we don't. Isn't that kind of cool? Isn't it cool that we have the hope that even though we may, we may be declining physically and mentally, um, we don't have to decline spiritually. I just want to talk about that. He gives strength to the weary. And I mean, how many of you love this verse? He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. And even youths grow weary and tired and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Isn't this beautiful? They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. At what point 
does your spiritual life have to begin to decline? Because our bodies and our brains will. And doesn't this verse kind of tell us from Isaiah 40 that our spirits never have to decline? Our spirits never have to grow old. I want to talk about hoping in the Lord. And, and, uh, and, and as I was kind of preparing for this and thinking through this for myself and, and kind of just thinking about my friends and thinking about my generation and, and thinking about our world and thinking about ads. And, and uh, you know, so I've been kind of brewing this for the last couple of weeks and listening to stuff on the radio. There is just so much out there that is speaking to the human race, especially the Western world, about trying to maintain your physical and your mental beauty, isn't there? And so that's just one of a million ads that I could have pulled up. Um, but, you know, we, we just somehow want to hang on to our youth. And they're this, this haunting um, gap, or there's, this, there's this, this void within us that we don't want this ever to end. And yet we know that that clock is winding down, and we look at ourselves as we go from, you know, 30 to 40 to 50, and we, we begin to notice the changes, and we want to stop the clock. And here's the thing that it, this, one of the thoughts that I had was this. Um, you know, um, if you believe like me that we are made up of body, soul, and spirit, some people say that we're, we're, we're made up of, you know, that the body and, and soul and spirit, and there's just two bits there. Um, uh, but you know, I think the Bible says that there's a body, soul, and a spirit, and I've thought about that a lot over the years. And um, and, and I think the way that we naturally as humans, the way we think of our, our bodies and, and then our inner self, our mind and our emotions, and if we believe that we have a spirit, the way we, we attack that naturally in the flesh is this way, that we spend a tremendous amount of time. We, we spend a tremendous amount of energy and a, a tremendous amount of money and worry looking after our bodies. And then we spend, uh, because that, and that's, that's the biggest bit that we see. And I think when a lot of us think, and this is the way I've often thought of the body, the soul, and the spirit. I think of the body as the big bit, and then the soul is probably in here somewhere. Um, you know, my emotions and, and my, my brain, which is in my stomach because I'm Italian. And, uh, and so we've got the soul, and then we think that that's the smaller bit. And then the, and then the inner bit, that's the spirit. And it's that, that quiet place. And, you know, we think of the Hebrew temple where there was the court of the, of the um, you know, the, the, um, the non-Jews, and that was big. And then there was, like, the, the inner court, and then there was the Holy of Holies. And so we think, you know, it's natural to think that the, that the further you go, the smaller it is. And we spend a lot of time on this big outside bit. And we try to look good, and we, we try to keep it healthy, and we try to eat well, and all those things are good. And then we put a bit of energy into our thinking, and we try to upgrade our, our uh, you know, our mind, and we try to look after our emotions. And yeah, and then we also want to look after our spirit. And and this is just this idea that I've had, and I've shared this with young people a fair bit. That I believe that, and this is you know, I don't read it in the Bible anywhere. It's just an intuitive kind of belief that when we meet God, and and we're living in this reality right now that. That, that, you know, our bodies are here and then our mind is, you know, smaller and our, soul, and our spirit is the little bit. I think when we meet God, we're going to see it's upside down and that our spirit is this vast piece of us, that God has created these magnificent, eternal spirits. And then within that spirit, there's the mind and the emotions, and that's smaller than the spirit. It's not as important. And then the, the thing that's the least important is our body. And when we meet God, you know, and I don't think he's going to judge us, and I don't think he's going to wrap us over the knuckles, but the reality will hit us. And Lord willing, it will hit you actually before you die, before you meet the Lord. The reality will hit us that why did we spend, why did we spend 80% of our effort and our worry and, and our time and our money on the thing that's only 1% of importance? this outer shell, and why did we waste so much time and not build up our, our thinking and our emotions, and more, most important of all, why didn't we spend the time building up our spirits? Which, again, I'm just making numbers up, but I, I fully believe this is the reality, 
that our spirits will be 99% of us, that we might only spend 1% of our lives and our time building up our spirits. Amen? And the cool thing is that this whole thing of aging means that the parts that, that, that is decaying, the part that's getting older and falling away, is the insignificant part of you. Amen? Amen. The second thing, so the first thing I just, that, that I was thinking about, I just wanted you to think about, is, you know, where is your hope? Uh, and that verse talked about hope, those who hope in the Lord. Secondly, um, yeah, and this, yeah, it doesn't only go for women, it's men as well, right? It's not only uh, women who look in the mirror, uh, but it's guys. But where is your heart? Our generation's problem is that we tried to grow up too fast. Um, and this is another aspect of this issue of aging. And so, so the common way to think about this, um, you know, it's, it's okay to not be okay. So, so we, we, we struggle with aging, and, and that's okay. That's natural. But we have to have an answer for it. But another thing that I see, especially amongst young people, is, is the propensity, is the desire for young people to grow up way too fast. And we try to escape being children, and, and I see it today. I, you know, I think I've, I've been working with young people for nearly 30 years, and I think it's worse today than it's ever been that young people are so desperate to become old people. They want to grow up. And yet the Bible says this. So this is the second thought. You know, he called a little child, and he had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's just something precious and something beautiful about being a little child. And I want to say to young people, don't hurry up. Don't hurry up. Don't rush to being an adult and don't, don't throw away your childlikeness and don't throw away your childhood. And what we do is we get on a, and I see this with young people, but, you know, I see it amongst middle age and I see it amongst the elderly as well, that we, um, we're always looking ahead. And I know, you know, and, and I know this from experience, that when I was in high school, man, I couldn't wait to get out of high school. You get to year 12 and year 13, I just couldn't wait to get out of high school and, and to go traveling or to go to university, um, you know, or to get a job. Just, just had to bust out, and I was looking ahead. And then, you know, you get to that place, and then you start thinking about, man, I can't wait to have a lifetime partner, a wife or a husband. I can't wait to meet that other and, uh, and, then we, and, and, and then that happens, and we start looking ahead. Man, I can't wait to get into my career. I can't wait to become successful. I can't wait to buy the house and the boat um, or whatever it is, the igloo if you live in Canada. I just can't wait, and we're looking ahead to that next thing. And then I can't wait to have children. Man, I just, you know, it's, my friends are having children, and we're looking ahead. I can't wait. And then we have our children. Then we want grandchildren, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we go, man, I wish I could become a young person again. And we've looked ahead, and we've looked ahead, and we find ourselves getting older and empty. And so the thing that Jesus says is that you become like a little child. And what's a little child like? I think a little child is appreciative of what is around that child today. You know, you, those of us that have had children, those of us that work with children, those of us that are children, uh, you... You, you see in children that they appreciate their surroundings. They appreciate the moonrise. They appreciate the ocean. They appreciate a flower. You can see a little child just spending hours and hours just looking at a ladybug. But as we get older, we begin missing that kind of stuff. And I think that's one of the aspects of a child that Jesus is talking about. And the last thing is where is your faith? And um, again, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about it's, it's okay not to be okay. So it's okay to be in this place where some of us are getting older and we're, we're mourning for the fact we're looking back to the day when we were younger and we're mourning the loss of some things and we're grieving. Uh, we've got young people who are looking ahead and they're missing their childhood. They're missing their youth because they keep looking ahead. And that's natural. That's that's part of being human. Um, but this last one I want to look at is where is your faith? And this is one more aspect of this, um, 
this issue that we have, this challenge that we have in this broken world where we are decaying, uh, not just us, but the Bible says that the whole world is decaying. Uh, the whole world is groaning. It's not what it should have been. It's not what it was created to be. You and I are not what we were created to be in perfection. And the last question I want to ask is, where is your faith? Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So there's an aspect here um, that I want to bring into this, this issue of, um, of us facing this challenge of aging, and that's whether you're young or whether you're old. And I want to bring the idea of faith into it. Now, and it's not just a challenge for those of us that are over 50 or 60 and, and we're facing the obvious aging challenge, but it's a challenge for young people as well because this is something that I'm seeing among young people. And, uh, and it really surprised me because, I, I, you know, I, I see young people transitioning from intermediate school to high school. And, and within a couple of years, they'll look back at intermediate kids, and I'm hearing this amongst our year 9 and 10 and 11s, and they go, man, I'm getting old. You know, so they'll run into, like, they'll see their little year, year, uh, uh, year 7s and 8s, and they go, I'm getting old. And especially, and this is where I see it the most, uh, young people who have transitioned out of high school, and they're, you know, they're in the workforce, and they're 18, 19, 20, 21, and they look back at high school kids, and they go, oh, man, I'm old, especially when they turn 20. I'm an old guy. I'm 20. What am I doing with my life? And I see it. It's a reality. And I, this is the last challenge I just want to bring to that, and it, it goes back to the book of Exodus, and I, and I think it's, again, it's part of the human condition. So it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's part of the human condition. But I, I really feel that God wants us to find an answer to this stuff. So even amongst young people, they're already grieving the fact that I'm no longer a kid. I'm no longer playing with my, with my Barbie and my Marvel toy. Um, I'm now, like, I'm, I'm this kind of young adult. And, of course, when you get to your 30s and your 40s, it becomes more natural, doesn't it? That You start looking back. You look at the photos, um, you know, like when you were, like, 25. And you, and you look at that photo when you're 40. And you go, holy man, who's that guy? You know, well, that's me. I, I can remember, like, throughout my whole um, youth, I was going to throw up a picture, but then I thought I better not. And I, I can remember going, man, I wish I didn't look this way. You know, it's hard for you to believe. But I haven't been a very good-looking guy. I know, you know, it's impossible. You, you know, like, I, you, you can't believe that. But, I, but it's true. And, uh, and I can remember going, man, I wish I didn't look this way. And, I, and, 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 you know, I got to 30 and 35 and 40. And then I started looking at pictures of myself when I was 25. I was going, Man, I was, I was a hunk. I was, look, look at my hair. Look how handsome I was. Man, I was fit. And I didn't appreciate it at the time. I didn't appreciate just how beautiful God had made me. And, uh, and it's looking back. You miss it. You miss it. And, and I know that, you know, young people, when, they, you know, when people are 20, 21, 22, they're grieving. They're already grieving what they've left behind. And especially when we get up into our 50s and our 60s, we, we begin to grieve. And so I just want to share this idea from the Israelites. So when the Israelites were taken um, in the book of, you know, in the first five books of the Bible or in, you know, the story of Moses and Exodus. So they were taken out of slavery. So, so God delivered them from sla slavery. Let my people go. And, and Moses led the people out into the wilderness, and he was leading them to something better. He was leading them to the promised land. And there are 15 different times when they were out in the wilderness going to something better, going to something more beautiful, that the Israelites grumbled to Moses 15 different times. It's, it's noted in the book of Exodus. And they, the Israelites grumbled and they said, if only we had died in Egypt, because there we sat around and we had pots of meat and we ate all that we wanted. And they grumbled because of what they had left behind and they weren't looking ahead to where God was leading them. And this is my final word that I, want, that I want to just leave in this whole area of aging, that we often look back and we grieve what we're leaving behind. And that's natural. It's okay. But God is challenging us tonight 
to see the things that we can't see. Faith is the assurance of things not seen. Faith is looking forward to a heaven and to a future that you can't see. And the, and, and, and the way this makes sense to me is you let go of the past and you embrace the unknown. It's the very, very basis of being a Christian. And, and I believe that you can sum up the whole issue that we have with aging and, and leaving one phase and going to another and, and being unsure of where we're going and being unhappy with where we're at and looking back, back and wishing that we had what we had in the past. And I believe that you can sum it all up in this beautiful image of faith that it's letting go of the past and it's embracing the unknown. If I can ask the, the band to come up and we'll close with this. And, P, and Paul says in Philippians, it's forgetting what's behind and straining forward to what is ahead. It's forgetting what's behind and straining forward to what is ahead. And again, as we said at the beginning, that our spirit is far more important. Our, our spirit, our inner self, is far more significant than our outer self. And that we, we, we struggle, and this is, this, is for, this is for the elderly, but it's also for the young people that we struggle with our today, that we struggle with, with where we're at, we struggle with the things that we've left behind. And God is saying, God challenges us as Christians to live by faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the certainty of things not seen. And we have to take hold of that today. You know, we asked that, uh, that question in Psalm 90. Um, David said, teach us to number our days. And I can remember sitting in my, um, in my Bible college chapel. One of the first times I was ever in that chapel, I was a brand new Christian. I was like 22 or 23 years old, and I, I went to Bible college in, uh, at Tyndale College. And I was sitting there, and, and the guy that spoke at that chapel, I can't remember who he was. I can't remember anything else he said. But he read that scripture, and, he, and I'm like 23. I got the whole world in front of me. I was grieving leaving my high school days because I had so much fun in high school. And he got up, and he said, Lord, and he read that passage, teach us to number our days so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And I have been thinking about that all these years, and that was over 30 years ago. And, and I, I've been through different phases, you know, and, and, and and the psalmist says, teach us to number our days. Well, why would you have to ask God to teach you to number your days? It's pretty simple, right? One, two, three. You can go back to the day that you were born, and you can just add them up, right? We can all do that. So why would we need God for that? So I began thinking, well, it's got to be more than that. And, and then I, I, I had a breakthrough about 10 years later. Ah, the way God wants us to number our days is to start counting backward. And that's what I thought was the answer, to kind of guess that, okay, if I make it to 80, I'm going to live 24,000 days. So now I've got maybe 10,000 left, 9,999, whatever, 9,098. Maybe that's the way that, we, that, 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 we, you know, that God would teach us to number our days. What do you think? How would God want you to number your days? Because that's what the psalm says, Psalm 90. And, and I think that the secret of this whole angst about aging, I think it's in that psalm. Teach us, Lord, to number our days. And then I feel more recently that God has opened, he's illuminated my heart. And you know what? I, I, I fully believe that the way God would have you number your days is like this. Is like this. Today is one today number my day by saying one day today is the day that the Lord has made let's rejoice today let's be glad in it today because brothers and sisters you know you know this is true for most of us we just rush through this life we just speed through this life from childhood to a hundred and we go at a hundred miles an hour and I think we miss so much. And that scripture says that Jesus says he wants us to become like children. And I think that the secret is in being a child that this is, I've got one day. And doesn't the scriptures teach us that? It says, don't worry about tomorrow. 
And Paul says, don't look back at the past, but to just live today, to accept, we had that communion, accept your forgiveness today. Accept the fact that God loves you today. Live in the reality that God holds tomorrow in his hands and he holds your past in his hands and he wants you to enjoy him today. Live fully today. Appreciate today. Thank him today. Worship him today. Love your children. Love your wife. Love your friends today. Father, we just thank you so much for your truth and for your word. And um, Father, thank you uh, that any, every issue that we face, uh, all these issues where we're not okay, whether it's physical problems or mental problems or financial problems or health or aging. Father, thank you that in every single one of these areas, you are our answer right now, that you have the answer in your presence. And all we need to do, Father, all we need to do is to let go Let go of what we want. Let go of what grieves us. And take both hands and take hold of you. And we will have our answer. And I just pray that, Father, for myself and for everybody here, Lord God, that today, today we will take hold of you in Jesus' name. Amen.